we don't want to waive that issue or, or fail to make a record. All right. Um, I'm also going to address the panel when they come out this morning on Veterans Day. Uh, just make sure nobody has any um, matters they need to address. Family matters, paying respects or something first thing in the morning. Uh, some folks do that, but I do intend to move forward uh, on Veterans Day and uh, continue with the case. All right, as to the, uh, the two open matters, the um, let me address the CAD reports first. Um, the, I was working through the testimony, and what I understood the investigator to testify to yesterday was that he had pulled information from the Glen County Police database, and I don't have my notes, I, I don't have the actual name of it, but they, it was not the Glen County Police database. What was a bit confusing to me, and what I think we were doing in cross-examination, Mr. Sheffield, is you had CAD reports, correct? They are, uh, they are CAD reports. Yes. Okay. And were the CAD reports limited to the Satilla Shores neighborhood? They were limited to the Satilla Shores neighborhood, and in particular, particular addresses within Satilla Shores. Okay. So what I what I heard, and this is where the disconnect started in my mind, we were talking about the Glen County database. I initially thought he had pulled information only because the state had requested it, but then it appears from his testimony associated with Greg McMichael's statements that he actually did do some follow-up in that database in order to well, follow up. What I didn't hear is that he had pulled any CAD data, which is a different database. Um, so what you've got is different information than what I heard him testify that he had done, done that he had pulled, um, which to the court is important because the, the question for him then is simply, did he pull the CAD reports? Does he know about them? Um, if he does or doesn't, then I think that answers the question. If he does know about them, then I think it's wide open to, to cross. If it's limited to Satilla Shores, the explanation from the court is, I understand part of what the defense is trying to put up is that um, in support of Greg McMichael's statement that there was some, there were some things going on in the neighborhood. What those are, I don't know, and how important it is to the case. Ultimately, it's for the jury to determine. So, uh, just to be clear, and I think I said this last night, the court's position is not that those CAD reports can't come in. I just don't think this is the witness for it. He never indicated that he pulled the CAD reports or would have any knowledge of it, and he wasn't asked about whether or not he would have knowledge of those CAD reports. So, the court indicated I would think that through a little bit more. I, we were getting a little sidetracked last night. So, to clarify, that's where the court is on the CAD reports. Thanks for taking the time to look at it. I understand what the court is saying. Right. On the 404B opening the door, the court is not uh, at this point uh, going to find that the state has opened the door. Um, I understand the arguments of counsel. I've heard them. I understand the, the testimony uh, about whether or not he was looked at as a suspect uh, is something that um, uh, I don't think is a, uh, an argument that's just being thrown out there for the sake of throwing out there. I see that as a serious issue, and I understand that um, well, I understand, I think the parties understand, the court is very cognizant of uh, whether that door gets opened at some point. In fact, has been told over and over again that that is a flag that may be raised, and uh, if it comes up under appropriate circumstances, uh, the court might rule differently. But at this point, based on the testimony that's been provided, the court is not going to get into, or allow the parties to get into the 404B evidence. I believe those are the two open matters the court has. I don't believe there are any additional open matters from yesterday. Not from the state, Your Honor. Not from Travis. Your Honor, my notes uh, did correspond to the conclusions that you reached with one exception <clears throat> that I wanted to place on the record. It does not seem that there was any indication that either Ms. Donikoski or the uh, 
Officer Marcy was ever pooling the reports for the purpose of seeing if, quote, Ahmad Arbery was a suspect in those cases. They were pooling the reports to follow up either on the information Greg McMichael had provided about other crimes in the neighborhood and or the request that Ms. Donikoski had made of that officer to go back to the reports they pooled to address the issue of rising crime in the neighborhood, which the state rejects. So the insertion of the phrase whether Ahmad Arbery was a suspect is what has tainted that evidence. And I wanted to place that on the record and is what we would argue the reason why the 404B door is beginning to open here. It would be completely inappropriate for the state to question an officer about suspicions that officer had about Mr. Arbery's involvement in crime in Satilla Shores, Royal Oaks, Fancy Bluff, or Highway 17. As the state has indicated, it's all one big, very close area. So to intimate that Ahmad was not a suspect in these reports, we all could tell that was kind of a useless question because the officer, there's no way that he went and investigated a suspicious person report. And we're not allowed to get into the content of those suspicious person's reports in case those identifying characteristics are consistent with Ahmad Arbery. We are following the court's ruling that we are not talking about Ahmad Arbery's criminal history or suspicions of criminal acts outside of what was taking place at 220 Satilla Drive. So with that caveat, I wanted to state our position. And that's the defendant's position. The court has already ruled. I've made clear what my ruling is. I understand that we're ready for the panel. Does the state have its next witness ready? Yes, Judge, we do. Okay. All right. Let's go get the panel. Thank you. All rise for the jury. Thank you. 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 Thank
but at this point for planning purposes do plan to be in court on Veterans Day okay so again if you need to get a note to me you're welcome to do so but with that that's all the housekeeping I've got for this morning uh, we are ready to proceed with the evidence as I understand uh, again I want to thank you for being here with us in Glen County and um, in the Superior Court state ready to proceed yes Your Honor, the state's ready. At this time, the state will call Detective Roderick Nohilly. Truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Go ahead, MC. All right, Detective, please state your name and spell it for the record. Roderick Nohilly, R O D E R I C, last name N O H I L L Y. All right, Detective Nohilly, how are you currently employed? I'm a sergeant on patrol with the Glen County Police Department. And how long have you been with the Glen County Police Department? For 16 years. And your entire time in law enforcement, has it been with the Glen County Police Department? No. I worked for Brunswick Police Department beforehand for about three and a half years. So you're coming up on 20 years? I am. All right. And are you currently a post-certified law enforcement officer? I am. And you're a sergeant over patrol, so what do you do now? I supervise a patrol shift. Yeah. And uh, those the officers who drive around the cars? Yes. All right. Do you drive around in a car? I drive around in a car, yes. All right. Do you respond to 911 calls? I do. Are you assigned to any particular baker? No. You're over all of them? Yes. <laughs> All right, so at any point in time with your um, tenure in Glen County, um, have you been assigned to CID or in any capacity um, investigating things like homicides, armed robberies, and things like that? Yes, I was uh, assigned as a criminal investigator in the Criminal Investigation Division. And when was that? For the first time from 2010 to around 2014, and the second from 2018 to few months ago, well, beginning of this year. Huh. Beginning of 2021. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. So I'm going to direct your attention specifically to February 23rd, 2020, in the evening at the Glen County Police Department headquarters. Were you present there at that time? Yes. All right. So what we're going to talk about specifically is an interview with Greg McMichael, okay? Yes. All right. Now, you're not the one who conducted the initial interview with Greg McMichael, did you? No. All right. You then became involved because you stopped by? Yes. Why did you stop by? I was standing by while uh, someone else was doing a, a statement for him. Uh, okay. I was just waiting. And did you know Greg McMichael prior to February 23rd of 2020? I did. Tell the jury how you knew Greg McMichael prior to February 23rd, 2020. I knew him as one of the investigators at the our DA's office here. Um, he would uh, come to our station, deliver subpoenas here and there, and I would talk to him. Uh, I knew him professionally. And how long had you known him professionally? Since at least 2005. So, any personal relationship, like out to dinner or anything like that? No. So, when you stopped by, was he still in the interview room and was the recording still going? Yes, it was. And yes, he was. Sorry, that was a bad question. So, he was still in the interview room? Yes, he was. And you stopped by to talk to him? Yes. Did he agree to speak with you freely and voluntarily? Yes. And what was kind of the nature or tone of the conversation you had with them? Uh, we were just talking about what happened. You know, he was telling me, telling me what happened. 
All right, so I'm going to hand you what has already been marked and admitted into evidence as State's Exhibit 225A. All right. Prior to coming to court today, have you had an opportunity to review State's Exhibit 225A, the transcript of the interview with Greg McMichael? I have. All right. And I'm going to direct your attention at this time specifically to page 59 of that transcript. All right. Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to have you specifically give the jury the quotes from your conversation with him starting at line two. What did you ask Greg McMichael? What's his name? The one who owns this house. Now, when you say the one who owns this house, what house are you referring to? The house that was under construction a few doors down from his home. Okay. And what was his answer to you? I have no idea. Never met him. Never met him. Okay. What is the next question that you asked Greg McMichael? Did this guy break into a house today? And what did Greg McMichael say in response from line 8 to line 13? Well, that's just it. I don't know. That's what I told. I told what's her name out there. I said, listen, you might want to go knock on doors down there because this guy had just done something that he was fleeing from. And I don't know, you know, you might have gone, he may, might have gone in somebody else's house. Okay. Or somebody's house. All right. So when he says, that's just it, I don't know, that's what I told, what's her name out there? Do you have any idea who what's her name out there is? I'm assuming at the time it was uh, Sergeant Oliver. Okay. So he's talking about, I was telling a law enforcement officer out there that they needed to go figure out what he might have done. Yes. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and direct your attention then to the very next page, page 60 of the transcript. Direct your attention specifically to line 7. What did you ask him? Have you ever seen him before? And when you say, have you ever seen him before, who are you referring to? Ahmaud Aubrey. At the time, we didn't know his identity. All right, so you didn't know what his name was at this time? No. So have you ever seen him before? What did Greg McMichael say? No, no. I would never laid eyes on, on the guy. You then say, okay. What does Mr. McMichael then say? Nobody in that neighborhood, or at least nobody that has seen the video that this guy has a clue. That this guy has a, a ha, has has a clue who he is. All right. I know that was that was difficult. Okay, so nobody in that neighborhood, or at least nobody that has seen the video, that this guy has has a clue who he is. Yes. All right. What did you ask next? Did he put it out on Facebook or something? The video. Now, who is he that you're talking about? Did he put it out on Facebook? the owner of the house under construction. All right. What was Mr. Gregory Michael's response? I don't know. He may have, but... Okay, so he says, I don't know about this video being put out on Facebook. Correct. All right. And then did you ask how many people in the neighborhood have seen this video? And what was his response? I know that Diego has, and... And then you were asking him who Diego was, right? Yeah. Is Diego the guy that, the other guy that came in? And he says, uh, Greg Michael says, no, that is. So then you asked him who Diego was, right? Yes. All right. So going on to the next page at the top, you ask him who Diego is on line three. What does Greg Michael say so he can tell you who Diego is? Diego is the little short Hispanic guy that lives like two doors down from that open house, the construction house. All right. Was he able to give you uh, Diego's last name? No, I don't believe so. All right. So 
So I'm going to go ahead and then direct your attention to um, specifically page 65. And at this point in time, are you asking Greg McMichael to speculate as to what was going through the mind of Maud Arbery? If you look at the line on page 64, would that help refresh your recollection about what you're talking about here? Which line? Take a look at lines 22 through 24 on page 64. Yes. Okay. So when asking Greg McMichael to speculate about what's going through the mind of Ahmaud Arbery, what does Greg McMichael say on lines three through six? He, he, was, he was trapped like a rat. I think he was wanting to flee, and he realized that something, you know, he was not going to get away. Okay. And then I think you indicated, and... Well, I'll ask you, what did you then say to him based on this? He was trapped like a rat. I think he was wanting to flee, and he realized he was not going to get away. Yeah. What did you say? Yeah, but he could have run around your son, right? What's he say? Sure, sure. Okay. And then what did you say? From what I can tell in the video, I mean the whole road is there. So you had seen the video at this point in time that you're talking to Gregory Michael? I had seen it uh, on scene uh, briefly. Yeah. Okay. So at that point in time, what does Greg McMichael say to you? <clears throat> Lines 12 through 16. Faster than Travis would ever be. He had opportunity to flee further, you know. We had chased him around the neighborhood a bit, but he wasn't winded at all. Continue. And then what's the next line? Just on 16, I mean? I mean, this guy was, he was in good shape. Okay. Now, after speaking with Greg McMichael, um, was Greg McMichael then free to leave and did he in fact leave? Yes. <clears throat> I will pass the witness. Thank you. You know, it actually will be Mr. Hogue. I'm just going to find that one map. Thank you, Honor. Good morning. I'm Frank Hogue. I represent Greg McMichael. This is Laura Hogue, my wife and law partner. She represents him with me. I just have a few questions for you today. And I want to go back to where you were with the state just now. <clears throat> and let's start, excuse me. <clears throat> let's start on page 59 and you were asked to read the section from lines 2 to 13 you tell me when you're with me and this is the topic concerning uh, no clue who he was he referring to Ahmad Arbery at that time on that date when this all happened right Got the context? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry, I was looking for the page. Okay. This, this is a section where, uh, and I just called it No Clue Who He Was. That was the point of it, right? The section you read. Objection right. to that character. All right, well, we can reread it then if, if summing it up isn't good enough. Let's just make sure he's on the same page. You're right. fine. You're at page 59, line 2. Go ahead and read 2 through 13 to yourself. That's what you read to the jury just a few minutes ago. Particularly lines 8 through 13 where Greg McMichael is telling you, that's just it, I don't know. That's what I told, and you said it was Sergeant Oliver that he was talking to 
uh, what's her name? He said, I said, listen, you might want to go knock on doors because this guy has just done something that he was fleeing from. And I don't know, you know, he might have gone in somebody's house. And <clears throat> your understanding in the context was when Mr. McMichael is telling you, I don't know, he, he didn't know the person's name. Objection. As to this officer's understanding of their context, it, it's not relevant. It's the context of what Mr. McMichael was saying to him that I'm trying to establish. Well, again, you're, <clears throat> you're asking him about what Greg McMichael was thinking and to explain his statements. Let's just rely upon his statements. If it's relevant in any other way, that's fine. But let's not characterize, have this witness characterize somebody else's statement, statements in the record. All right. <clears throat> um, Mr. McMichael couldn't tell you Ahmaud Arbery's name, could he? Correct. Because he said he didn't know his name, didn't he? Correct. All right. Well, let's go on with that page to get further context here. Uh, you go on to ask him, I'm at line 14, you were the first one to see him? That was a question from you. And Mr. McMichael said, <coughs> yeah, well, I guess, I don't know if somebody else saw him running, uh, think anything about it, but when he came past my house. Objection. Mr. Hogue is just now reading this section as opposed to asking this officer what it is. In addition, it has absolutely nothing to do, it's not the real completeness, it has nothing to do with what was above at all. I understand we're talking about context for statements. I understand yeah. these are the words of Greg McMichael. They've right. come in a couple different ways. Let's get to the context question. How's that? Let's make sure. I'm, let's get to the question part of it. This is a question. This is what Greg McMichael was saying to you immediately after telling you he didn't know the name of the person he saw running in his neighborhood, right? That's the context of what we're talking about, <coughs> correct? As far as line 16 on? Right. Yes. Okay. And so what I'm doing with you, Investigator Nohilly, is I'm just reading the words on the transcript and you're affirming, yes, that's what Greg McMichael said to me. That's the form of all these questions, all right? You with me? Yes. Okay, good deal. So going on, uh, he says, but when he came past my house, he was, he met the description of the guy that Travis had seen run in that, that empty house, you know, two weeks ago or however long ago it was. You say, yeah. And Mr. McMichael, so far I'm reading accurately, am I not? Yes. And then at line 23, Greg McMichael, I mean, to a T. Plus, he met the description of the video I had seen of this guy being in there. Short dreads, and go over to line one on page 60, you say, yeah. And then Mr. Greg McMichael says, white t-shirt, short pants, I mean, plus he was hauling ass. And, and you know this, he was running like people don't run normally. He wasn't out for no Sunday jog. He was getting the hell out of there. I read all that accurately? Yes. And in context, even though he's told you he doesn't know this person's name, he's telling you, in effect, why he suspected him and then Jeff, chased him. Question, that, characterization. That's sustained. Okay, you understood what he was talking about, right? I mean, you, uh, you were involved in the conversation and the words he was conveying back to you in response to your questions to him were understandable to you, were they not? You knew what he was talking about? Yes. Okay, very good, sir. Now, <clears throat> let's go over to page 65, the other part of the transcript the state just reviewed with you. <clears throat> they read the part on 65, page 3, or line 3 rather, 
um, down to line 16. And at line 16 is where the, the conversation was in the middle of Greg McMichael's comments to you about Ahmaud Arbery, where he said, I mean, this guy, he was in good shape. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. And then he goes on to say, in that same context, completing his thoughts to you, <clears throat> and there was no, no hesitation on his part when he came to Travis. I mean, it was, I think he was, his intention was to grab that gun and probably shoot Travis. That's in my mind, that's what I saw, you know. And with that in mind, if he, if he had gotten that shotgun and there was any separation between Travis and him, I was going to cap his ass. And you understood he was describing to you the fight right at the very end of the confrontation that you perhaps had seen on video by this point. Is that what you understood the context of this to be? I'm going to object as to his understanding of what the context is. These are just the words of Gregory Michael. His understanding is not relevant. Well, then that is the context in which he's saying these words. He's describing the final encounter between Ahmad Arbery and Travis and that he thought Ahmad was trying to get the shotgun away from Travis to shoot him with it. That's what he's telling you, right? Objection counsel is now testifying. <clears throat> So let's, again, this, this statement is coming through the witness. The statement's in. Uh, for context, you can ask the witness what he believes he was describing, but let's let the words of Mr. McMichael work. All right, for context, Investigator Noheli, you understand what he's describing, right? Yes. And you understood what he was describing was his own thoughts that he was about to see his own son shot and killed by Ahmaud Arbery with his own shotgun. Objection calls for speculation as to what this means by Gregory Michael. Well, at this point, we're simply asking what the witness understood based on his interview with the um, uh, with Mr. McMichael. Go ahead. You need me to repeat it, you're allowed to answer. Okay. In the context of this conversation, you understood Greg McMichael to be telling you that what he thought when he was watching Ahmaud Arbery attack his son. Objection, mischaracterization, counsel's testifying. That is not at all what Greg McMichael said. Didn't use the word attack at all. Okay, I'll use his words. His intention was to grab that shotgun and probably shoot Travis. That's in my mind. Those were his words, right? Yes. And, and you understood that what he was conveying to you was that he thought he was about to witness his son's death at the hands of a monarch. Correction, speculation. Yeah, the, statements are, the statement speaks for itself. He, it's sustained. All right. Go over to page 67. <coughs> See if we can get through this one. State objects to anything on 67. We didn't bring up 67. That's not something he's testified to at all. So <coughs> there is no rule of completeness here. This is a completely different page and topic. Well, that's not the case, Your Honor. And if I need to defend it without the jury here, I'd like to do so. Let me go ahead and see what it is. <coughs> Um, let me see if I have a, I have notes written on here. I'll show. I'm bringing my computer. Down. Does anyone just have a clean copy of it? That's the easiest way to do it. Nobody's got a clean copy of page 67? Yes, I do have a clean copy for you. Yes. It's just have one. That's what you know. Well, that's true. <laughs> Detective, could you hand that to the judge? <laughs> Detective. Next to the webpage. Problems 
and every time I move, I pull a cord out. Your Honor, I'm at page 67, lines 8 through 17. <clears throat> Eight through eighteen and sixty seven, you said? Page sixty seven, lines eight through seventeen. Eight through seventeen. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I'll permit the, uh, the question. Go ahead. All right. Now, before we read it, Investigator Nohilly, in your 20 years experience and in your training and education, uh, you've, you've heard of a phenomenon before called auditory exclusion, where a person is so focused in a traumatic event, their vision Objection. might... Counsel's testifying. He hasn't even given him an opportunity to say whether he knows what that word auditory whatever it was is. I have him on cross examination, and leading questions are allowed under 24-6-611-B and C. We can look that up. These are proper questions. Okay. Well, you asked him whether he knew what something was, and you're about to define it for him. That's the objection to, to, to the question. Give, yeah, to give him the orientation of what I'm talking about. He might not by some other term. It has several different terms. I've used one of those terms. Do you know auditory exclusion? Have you heard of that one? I have. I don't recall okay. what it means. Well, let me help see if this refreshes your recollection. <laughs> uh, you've heard of it. It's the occasion when a person in a traumatic situation... Objection. At this point, counsel is testifying by telling him what this means. Um, it, so it's, <coughs> it's a leading question. It's over. Go ahead. So an auditory exclusion, <clears throat> you're in a traumatic situation and of your senses, your vision will retain its best abilities, but your hearing and other senses, auditory hearing in particular, might tune out sounds and you don't hear and you don't recall accurately, but you can also describe what you saw, but not what you heard. That's what you recall from your training that happens sometimes to people in highly traumatic or unusual situations like a shooting. I don't recall if that's exactly what I learned. Is it, is it a phenomenon you're familiar with by whatever name? The term, yes. Okay. So let's go to this paragraph here. 67 page, or line 8. <clears throat> you ask Greg McMichael... Was he hit all three times, or? Now, the he is Mott Arbery, right? Yes. And the hit means hit with three shots from Travis's shotgun, right? Correct. And Greg McMichael answers, there was only two shots. See that? Yes. And you say, no, there were three, right? Correct. And he says, were there three shots? Asks you that, right? Yes. And you say, on the video, it sounds like there's three. You'd seen the video, right? Yes. <clears throat> sounds like there's three. Greg McMichael says, I, I don't think so. I mean, it may have been three. I don't know. But I, like I say, it was... It was a fur ball. It was a hair ball. <clears throat> but he 
thought he heard two and you heard three and there's three on the video, right? From what I remember, yes. Yeah. And when you, <clears throat> uh, uh, you probably arrested many people through your 20 year career, right? I have. And when you do that um, and you try to keep the person from fleeing from you, you will use verbal commands like stop, don't run, stay where you are, that kind of thing? Yes. And if you have to raise your voice to give a stronger verbal command, you will do that? Yes. And if the person is still not compliant, um, you'll sometimes draw your weapon if you need to, won't you? Only in certain circumstances. Like when they're not listening to you in your verbal commands, not stopping? No. Yeah. No what? No, I don't just pull my gun. Okay. You'll do other steps before you pull your gun to get them to comply with you? Yes. Like, what, raising your voice even higher, louder? Maybe. All right. Well, you'll do whatever the circumstances require. You're not just going to forget about it and go home, all right? Correct. All right. And if the person <clears throat> is still not complying with your verbal commands um, and you're waiting for someone to come back you up like other police officers, at some point, if you think the person is either going to attack you or flee, you will use your weapon, will you not? Not always, no. If the person is attacking you? Depends on how he's attacking me or she. All right. Uh, if you have a gun on you and the person is attacking you, you would have a concern that the person might take your gun from you and use it to harm you or kill you? Once again, it depends on the circumstances and the person. All right. If the circumstance includes being attacked by someone who seems to be trying to take your gun from you, putting his hands on it, you might use your gun, wouldn't you? At that point, it might meet the threshold, yes. Thank you, Investigator Nunnilly. investigation and your role in this particular investigation was it that you were charged with I will do it was it that you were charged with gathering just information from Greg McMichael and Travis McMichael and that was the sole job that you had in this particular case yes just to perform the interviews yes okay and you were directed to do so by Investigator Lowry? I'm not sure exactly. I was told to see him to go back to the station and do the interviews. You'll have to speak up just a yeah, little bit. You're okay. dropping I'm off. Sorry. That's okay. I was told, I'm not sure exactly by who, uh, I think it was one of my supervisors possibly to go to the station and do the interviews. Prior to the interviews, though, you had a debriefing with whomever was in charge so that they could give you some background information about what had happened that day based on their observations? No. So did you go into these interviews not knowing what had happened out there in Satilla Shores? Correct. Literally, you didn't know outside the order of, of events or anything like that? Right, outside of seeing that video, no. Okay, so seeing the video, did, the, the video that you saw was, did it include Mr. Arbery running and then turning around and the car, driver of the car dropping the phone for about a minute and then it being picked back up and then filming as Mr. Arbery comes around the corner towards the shooting? 
or did you just see the shooting? Portion? I think I just saw the shooting part of it. Okay, so not even the entire video. Right, I didn't see the whole video. Okay, so you're stepping into a situation where you really don't know much other than that there's been a shooting. Correct. And did you say you were on the scene that day? I had gone up to the scene, you yes. You gone. How long were you on the scene before you left to go do interviews? <clears throat> like two or three minutes. Okay, so you're really kind of an open book when you head into these interviews, not having anything in your mind that you're trying to get out of these individuals, just that you're trying to understand what happened. Correct. Okay, so in your mind then, you are trying to understand the dynamics of what Greg McMichael and Travis McMichael were doing out there that day. Correct. And what Mr. Arbery was doing out there that day. Correct. What Greg McMichael's intent was, based on whatever he told you, right? Correct. And you conducted an interview of Travis McMichael as well, so what Travis McMichael's intent was out there that day. I'm going to object at this time. We're not going into Travis McMichael's interview at all, so I don't know why we're talking about it with this witness. I just asked if he'd done it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, he's interviewed Travis McMichael. I'm going to ask him about it. I'm not going to get into statements made. Okay. All right. That you, you were trying to determine what Travis McMichael's intent was that day. Correct. And what Mr. Arbery's intent was that day. Correct. Okay. In doing so, you got some information about ongoing crime in the neighborhood. I'm going to object. Now we're going into content. I'll, I'll rephrase it so that thank you. When you talked to Greg McMichael, you got information that there was some ongoing crime in the neighborhood. You'll have to direct me to a line. I don't recall exactly. Okay. Did, uh, just as you sit here, do you recall whether or not you talked with Greg McMichael about crime in the neighborhood? I, yes, yes. Okay. Did you endeavor after this interview to go and follow up about the crime in the neighborhood to pull any reports or anything like that? I don't think it was me that did it. Uh, I think I passed that on information on to other investigators and they did. Okay, that's fine. You didn't do it. That's fine. In stepping into a situation where you're going to be conducting an interview of a person just involved in a violent situation like this one, you have been trained how to interview individuals, correct? Correct. Yeah. You have some basic training that you go through about how to interview people. Have you had more advanced training on how to conduct interviews of suspects or people involved in traumatic situations? I have. Is it fair to say that it's important to have that training because interviewing someone can be a bit of a chaotic experience? Correct. The person that you're interviewing could be all over the map in terms of the timeline of the, the event. Correct. You may have to stop them because it can get very confusing and kind of redirect them back to moments that they can then break down and further explain to you. Correct. And is it fair to say that your training has helped you become the person kind of in charge of that process? Correct. To help that person through their statement so that it can ultimately be understood by you. Correct. Okay. Because what you, what you know is that whatever the garbled or asynchronous timeline that you could get needs to be understood eventually by lawyers in the case. Correct. So you may have to follow back up on something to get more clarity so that it can be further flushed out. Yes. And not only do you know that the lawyers in the case are going to rely on it, but you know that it's going to be used here in court, possibly. Correct. And that the work that you're doing to flush out these subjects and to dig deeper into what's being said is possibly going to need to be understood by the court as well as a jury. Yes. All right. So you're, you're going to do your best to try to follow up on things so that the interview that you conduct is as accurate and complete and truthful as it can be. Correct. Okay.
Now, you did interview Travis. Yes. You spent a good bit of time with him, maybe an hour or longer. Yes. Okay. He was speaking quickly during that interview at times, wasn't he? Good. I'm going to, once again, we're not introducing the statements of Travis McMichael. So going through all of this, I would object as it's not relevant. Here's, this, here's what's interesting. He conducted an interview. I object to oh, yeah. speaking. Yeah, okay. well, let me, let me, because I think I need to work out exactly what's going on here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to ask that you go ahead and step into the jury room for just a moment while we address the matters before the court. All right, for the Sergeant, if I could get you to just step down, if you just step out of the courtroom, we'll bring you back in for further testimony. Yes, Somebody give me a little context here. Sure. At this point in well, time. Well, maybe the better way to do it. Let me explain what I understand. And I can say. So Travis McMichael's statement, I'm guessing, is not being used because it's just there's too many issues to work through with Bruton that it's just not being used. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yesterday morning we informed the defense that we had made a decision not to tender or present any statements of Travis McMichael once they informed us that they basically wanted the entire thing in um, for rule of completeness. And we made the decision and informed them we're not tendering in Travis McMichael's statement at all, as currently right now hearsay. I talked with Mr. Rubin this morning and I said, listen, I don't even want to go into the fact that he went ahead and interviewed Travis McMichael because we're not tendering it in. Because now the jury is looking at us like we're hiding his statement. And my, I, it, my fear, of course, is that, I, okay, I'll back up. The state's a little frustrated because the state has endeavored to communicate to the defense that we were not going to put this in. In fact, this morning I told Mr. Rubin, I'm not even going to ask this witness about Travis McMichael's statement at all. I'm going to just strictly have him on the stand to talk about Greg McMichael. I informed them of that and I was told that's fine. We can recall him at a time if it becomes necessary if Travis McMichael takes the stand. So at this point in time, having not gone into it, the state's fear is that it appears to the jury that, oh, there's this statement of Travis McMichael out there. And I've been put in the position of having to object about the contents of it and tell them we're not tendering it, which of course makes it look like the state's hiding this statement from them when that's not the intention. The state's been put in an awkward position. The state would like a curative instruction and that's what we're asking for. Okay. So as I understand it, the state asked to put in certain statements of Travis McMichael. We responded and said we think this helps the rule of completeness. They chose not to put the statement in, and I'm not offering any of his statement. I'm not going to say anything that Travis McMichael said, although there are probably some exceptions under excited utterance. I'm still not putting those in. That being said, the state's decision not to tell the jury that he was even interviewed, that's on them. I'm not, I'm not hiding something. It would be as if in a car accident case, a police officer testifies about something through the plaintiff and the defense comes up and says, hey officer, didn't you also talk to a witness and didn't you also collect this information and didn't you also investigate these other things? They chose not to bring it up. I'm, I'm not doing anything that's untoward. I'm simply informing the jury that, number one, he was interviewed. Number two, certain conduct and behavior was um, was was seen by this officer that he voluntary co voluntarily cooperated in the interview. Okay, uh, we're not going to get into. Uh, 
problem with asking him about the way he was reacting is it opens the door to what questions were being asked at the time and the context of those reactions, which then possibly gets us into the statement. That's my concern about that. The fact that he was interviewed, I don't know, that's, that's fine, or the fact that he cooperated is fine. But once we start describing his actions during the interview, I'm not sure how you separate that from what was going on in the interview at the time. He appeared stressed, he was speaking quickly. Those are my questions. In an hour-long interview, at what point during the interview, what was he being asked about? It, I'm not going to go into that. Well, and the jury's but, left without the information about it, but Judge, that's, that doesn't make it impermissible. I would, I would, I would say the to the court, court, doesn't make it impermissible. Without the context, because I understand the statement's not coming in, we're not going to talk about it. It's an hour-long statement. I don't know, and the jury doesn't know what was going on at the moments that he could possibly be described, because what you are implying is that during that entire one hour period he was acting exactly the same way. I can clear that up. I mean, I feel like the court is telling me how to conduct, if the subject matter is I, relevant. That's my, that's my question. I don't believe it is because without the statement coming in, describing his conduct while giving that statement without explaining what the statement is, the court finds impermissible. So the beginning of this and the end of that, I don't know, the court, it's not it's going to allow you to go into but as far as what he was doing how this officer was perceiving his reaction excuse me reactions we're not going to get into that did he cooperate sure did he give a statement that's fine will the court allow me to uh, ask the witness the subjects that he inquired of no because then we're getting into the statement that he asked about not what travis said in response because then we're getting into the statement okay I think those would be permissible areas, but I'll follow the ruling of the court and I won't ask those questions. All right. Let's yeah, I, I would like to say, uh, in light of the state's comments, that it was the Bruton problem that primarily drove their decision not to go into any of Travis McMichael's statement. Bruton problem, of course, being that he would incriminate Greg McMichael. Um, we, we don't have a Bruton problem in, in Travis McMichael's statement. Uh, there's many parts of it that have been highlighted in yellow that were worked out. It looks to me like every bit as much as was in Greg McMichael's statement that we just spent part of yesterday and part of today doing. Um, so our position is that for us, I, I was under the impression that it was probably not going to be introduced because it's so exculpatory and that and the state was making the decision well he'll have to get up there and tell his story <coughs> himself we're not going to do it through our witness but if it's a brutal problem then any issue we have made before regarding travis mcmichael's statement with respect to bruton we withdraw and so that's not an impediment for our client Well, that, can, that may cure it for the state, and they may want to get back up and do it, but uh, I don't Your know Honor, where we are. Travis McMichael's statement is hearsay. It would come in if the state chose to tender it as the statement of a party opponent. The state is choosing not to tender it as a statement of a party opponent, so none of those issues apply. It's the state's decision not to tender in that hearsay under that exception. It sounds like it doesn't change where the court is on it. Yeah, and I would ask the court, there's no need for a curative instruction at this point. Yeah, we're just uh, going to bring the panel also, back in. Real quickly, Judge, oh. I was also going to ask him whether or not Travis demonstrated positions with how he was holding the firearm. And that demonstration, again, I thought would be not a statement, but just in response to the question of, uh, how he dis demonstrated certain things for him that he cooperated he demonstrated he spoke those kinds of things yeah, no, that's the, the court would be consistent uh, again to explain the context of that you'd have to get into the statement why he was doing that at a particular time and what the questions were that led him to that so again that gets into the statement itself so i will not do it based on the court saying i can't i may not do it. i cannot do it correct okay. all right let's go get the witness <clears throat>
Lösen. Just a second. Let's go get the panel. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Sheffield. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, we were talking about that you conducted an interview of Travis McMichael. Yes. Yes. And one of the things that you do when you conduct an interview is you want to make sure that the person you interview understands that they don't have to speak to you, right? Correct. As we call this the Miranda admonition, that they have the right to be silent, right? Correct. They have the right to a lawyer. Objection at this point in time, we're going into the interview. I'm just going into Miranda. I'll give you some flexibility here, but let's... To be sure, Travis agreed to be interviewed. Yes. Okay. He cooperated with that interview fully and freely. Yes. But one of the things you were asked about just a moment ago is Greg's statement to you and Greg's expressions to you about Mr. Ahmad Arbery and whether he was trying to run or flee or how he could have run or taken other routes or whatnot. You recall that line of questioning by Mr. Hogue? Yes. Okay. Did you ever undertake it yourself after speaking with Greg McMichael to try to figure out any background on Mr. Arbery? I did not. You did not. Not me. Not you. But you're aware that others may have. Yes. Okay. And lastly, when you're, you've been an officer for how many years, did you say? Just under 20 years. 20 years, doing patrol. Including patrol, yes. And you have investigated crimes of break-ins. I have. Crimes of theft. I have. Crimes of burglary. I have. And one of the things that you've come to understand is that burglary doesn't just happen at night, right? Correct. It happens in the middle of the day sometimes. Yes. In particular on Sundays. I don't know if it's particularly on Sundays. If you look at page 72, isn't that what you discussed with Greg McMichael? Starting at line 10. Usually on Sunday. Yes, what that's said. what I said. Yes. Nothing further. Thank you. 
Do you think Mr. Brown? No, Your Honor. Any redirect? Sure. Vector Investigator No. Hilly. Right after you said, usually on Sunday, what did Greg McMichael say? That's right, that's right. Then what did he say? People are home on Sundays. People are home on Sundays. All right. And at the time of this interview, this was how many hours after the incident had taken place? A couple of hours, I think. I'm not exactly sure who was in within two or three hours of the incident. Okay, so two or three hours of the incident? Yes. You believe? Okay. May step down. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, you are excused for the day, but subject to recall. Subject to recall, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, let's go ahead and take a 15 minute recess and we'll come back for the continuation of evidence in this case. All right, for sure. have the uh, state's next witness ready to go in 15 minutes, the uh, 1030. All right, thank you, everybody. Pardon? I believe it would be Chavez.
sleep with. All right, we are back on defendant's present, represented by counsel. <coughs> there we go. Oh. We actually need her for this witness. As I said, we're back on represented by counsel. Is the uh, state ready to proceed? Yes, Judge. All right. Let's go ahead and get the panel. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are ready to proceed with the evidence in this case from the state. Thank you, Judge. At this time, the state will call Mr. Matt Albensley. Truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. Go ahead and see. <clears throat> sir, please state your name and spell it for the record. Uh, Matthew Albenzi. It's M A T T H E W A L B E N Z E. And Mr. Albenze, what neighborhood do you live in? Satilla Shores. How long have you lived in Satilla Shores? Since July 89. 32 years, 33 years, 32 years, 31 years. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And what's the specific address that you live at? 309 Jones Road. What do you do for a living? Uh, calibration technician. And what are the normal hours that you work? Well, when do you leave to go to work? And when do you leave to go to work? And when do you come home? I uh, leave around 5.30, 5.40 in the morning, get home around 4.30, 4.45 in the afternoon. Right. So prior to February of 2020. Oh, we got upset from your mic. I don't know. It appears it, it might be. I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh, there we go. That may be it. Just push that maybe just a little bit away from you. <laughs> Let's, Let's try that. Okay. Thank you, Judge. So prior to February of 2020, did you know Mr. William Roddy Bryan? Uh, we'd met before. Yeah. All right. How many times had you met before? It was casual passing at a hardware store or maybe up at Zachary's. How would you describe your relationship with him? Just an uh, acquaintance. Uh, had you ever been to his home in Satilla Shores? No. Had he ever been to your house in Satilla Shores? No. Did you even know where he lived? I had an idea. With regard to Greg McMichael, did you know Mr. Greg McMichael <clears throat> prior to February of 2020? Yes. How did you know him? His neighbors. Had he ever been over to your house? No. Did you ever been over to his house for like dinner or anything? No. And Travis McMichael, did you know him? Yes. And how did you know Travis McMichael? Same, same type of relationship, just neighbors. We 
talking the driveway. I think most of the time we ever spoke with each other in the driveway, just friendly conversation about, you know, trucks and boats and fishing and stuff like that. All right. And back in February of 2020, you knew where the McMichaels lived? Yes. Now, with regard to Mr. Ahmad Arbery, did you know him? No. Had you ever seen him in the neighborhood before? No. Had you ever seen him, period, before? No. Now, in relationship to your house, where is the open, unsecured construction site at 220 Satilla Drive? At the end of the street I live on. And how long has that location been under construction? Two and a half years, maybe, at that point. I'm not sure. Okay, so at that point, two and a half years? What was there before it became a construction site? It was a vacant lot. So I'm going to show you what I've marked as states exhibits 284 and 285. Take a look at 284 and 285 and see if you're able to recognize what's depicted in those photographs. Yep. Are they fair and accurate? Yeah. At this time, the state would tender into evidence 284 and 285. No objection. No objection. No objection. Third amendment. So Mr. Albenzi, you'll be able to see it here on your screen. So I'm looking at 284. looking at here? That's the Mr. English's house just above the garbage cans there. Right here? Yeah, and that and to the right. So all of this right. being English's property? Yes. All right. And so where are we kind of standing looking down the street? Uh, be about at the end of my driveway, I think. Approximately. All right. And what road is this road? Right? Jones Road. Now, whose house is this? Uh, Kenny Wade. Right. What, do you know what Mr. Wade does? No. I think he's retired. So then looking at 285, is this just a further close-up shot? Yes. Great. It's just our court reporter needs to take down everything we're saying. Thanks. <clears throat> now, do you know Larry English personally? Uh, we've met, yeah. I introduced myself. Uh, this is my mailbox. This is the white mailbox here. So I walk down there every afternoon and check my mail. So that's your mailbox? Yeah. Okay. Um, so how many times do you think you've met or talked with Larry English prior to February 23rd of 2020? A half a dozen, ten times, maybe a dozen, I'm not sure. He ever come to your house, you ever go to his house? No, I've talked to him either at the mailbox or, you know, uh, spoke to him in his backyard. He had an excavator putting some concrete on the riverbank, just, like that. yeah. All right. And had you ever seen various people at his open, unsecured construction site? Uh, maybe some contractors every now and then. Any looky-loos? People just stopping by to look at the property? No. no. No, you didn't see that? No, I did not see that. Okay. From about October of 2019 through February of 2020, what condition was the open unsecured construction site? Was it like fully open that you could walk in? Yeah, uh, no garage doors. 
I don't think the front door is on it. I, Were there any no trespassing signs up? I don't know. Now, at some point in time, when you talked with Larry English, did he show you a video? Did he show you a video of someone who had come onto his property at night? Yes. And what was that person doing? I was looking around, walking around on his dock. The dock video? Yes. Did he show you any other videos other than the doc video? No. Do you remember what day it was that he showed this video to no. you? No. Uh, maybe October, November time frame of 19. Okay. And at any point in time, did Larry English talk to you about items that had been stolen off of his boat, like some fishing equipment and a cooler? Yes. All right, and who did he suspect had taken those things? He didn't really say, he just told me there had been some contractors work. I object to hearsay from Mr. English what he told this witness. Sustained. Okay. <clears throat> now, did you repeat what Mr. English had told you to anyone else? Not that I recall, no. All right, I'm going to direct your attention, Mr. Albenze, specifically to February 23rd, 2020, approximately 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Tell the jury what you were doing that day. I was uh, running a log splitter in my front yard, splitting wood. And how were you dressed? I had on boots and gloves and overalls. All right. What did you see? Um, I just stood up to move some wood uh, and I noticed Mr. Arbery standing in the front yard of that house. Now at that point in time did you know his name? No. Okay. So he was a stranger to you? Yes. Alright, so you saw him standing in front of the house? Yes. How was he dressed? Uh, maybe a t-shirt and shorts. Mm -hmm. Did he have any bags with him? No, I, not that I recall. No. Backpack on him? No. What did you see the young man do? He was just standing there looking around. I miss it's a good distance away. But. So what did you decide to do? What happened next? Um, what came to mind was Mr. English's video, something that looked like that on his dock at night. So I shut the splitter off, grabbed my phone, walked down to the corner. And did you go in the house and get something else too? Yeah, I had a pistol in my pocket. Okay, so you got your phone, you got your gun, and you walked down to the end of the, the drive, or the end of the street. Right. All right, so on State's Exhibit 285, where did you stand? Behind an oak tree next to the stop sign. The right in here? Uh, behind the oak tree. Like right here? Yeah. Well, behind it, but the tree was between myself and the house. Ah, so more like right here. Yeah. Got it. And what did you do then? Uh, I, I saw someone moving around inside the house, so <coughs> I pushed the send button, called Glen County Police. All right, so when you hit the send button, what number did you dial? The 7800 number. What's the 7800 number? It's the Glen County Police Department. So you didn't dial 911? No. All right. Why didn't you dial 911? I did not see an emergency. So you dialed the non-emergency Glen County number and were you connected to an operator? I was. Have you had the opportunity to listen to that 911 call? I've heard it a time or two, yeah. Okay. And you and I have met before, right? Right. Yes. And I played for you? Yes, you did. Okay. And at that time, was it a fair and accurate depiction of what you said to 911? Evidently, it's a recording, so yeah. All right. So, Your Honor, at this time, the state will tender into evidence. Let me make sure I get the right number. <coughs> state.
State's Exhibit 143. No objection, Your Honor. No, no. objection, Your Honor. No objection. It's okay. Statement published. to see Mr. Arbery inside the house when you were standing behind kind of the oak tree area? Yeah. Could you tell what he was doing inside the house? No. Now, you can't read minds, right? Nope. All right. So you have no idea what he was doing inside the house? No, ma'am. And do you have any idea why he ran from the house? No, I don't. Now, after you hung up with 911, what happened next? I uh, walked back to my house. Okay. Do you recall at all walking down the street a little further in front of, um, I guess, Subi Lawrence on one side and Diego Perez on the other side, down that street a little bit? Yeah. Okay. And do you remember making any sort of motion? I saw in the video, you know, there he goes. And who are you doing that to? I was just thinking to myself, run on down the street. Were you intending to communicate to anyone in particular at that time? No. And after you stood in the street and made the arm motion, what did you do then? I went home. At any point in time, did you call Greg or Travis McMichael? No. Do you communicate them with communicate with them in any way, shape, or form? No. After you went home, what happened next? Uh, after a few minutes, I heard gunshots. How many gunshots did you hear? Three. What did you do once you'd heard those three gunshots? I uh, got my bicycle out of the shop and rode down around the corner. You say down the corner, where'd you go? Down to Satilla Drive, left. 
So you came down Jones and then went down Satilla. Right. Is that the same way that Mr. Arbery had run? Yes. What'd you find? I saw a police car. I saw Mr. Arby laying on the street. I saw Miss Greg and Travis there. What did you do? I stopped and went home. As you know, it's kind of a shocking scene, you know. And did you ride your bicycle back home? I did. Later that evening, were you contacted by officers from the Glen County Police Department? Yeah. And did you speak with them at that time? I suppose, yeah, I did. Do you recall that at all? Not really. Okay. <clears throat> um, at that point in time, just to put it politely, had you had a, an adult beverage or cocktail at that point in time? Several, yeah. Now, have you personally ever been the victim of property theft within Satilla Shores? Uh, my daughter's car was broken into, gosh, 20 years ago maybe. I, it's been a long time ago. But nothing in 2019 or 2020? No. <clears throat> and do you subscribe to the Satilla Shores Facebook page? Yeah. Do you occasionally post there? Yeah. Um, and do neighbors post about their concerns about crime in the neighborhood on that Facebook page? Yeah, they did. Okay. And is that normal for people to be concerned about property thefts and crime in a neighborhood? Objection is asking this witness to speculate what other people do. <coughs> State. Were you concerned about property thefts in Satilla Shores? Of course. Why? It's our home. Now, did you have any personal knowledge about any burglaries that had taken place in Satilla Shores in 2019 or 2020? Car break-ins, you mean? Uh, so we'll talk about, did you know about some car break-ins? Yeah. And how did you found how did you find out about the car break-ins? It's uh, on the Facebook page. Okay. Had anybody actually personally spoken to you about their car break-in, like one-on-one, -on -one and you interviewed mm -hmm. them and you got information about it? No. to show you State's Exhibit 127. 127. So Mr. Albanzi, I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 127, see if you're able to recognize this particular image. I do. All right. And is it fair and accurate? It was then, yeah. All right. At this time, the State would tender into evidence State's Exhibit 127. No objection. No objection. No objection. It's admitted. Exhibit 127. Go ahead and orient the jury. Where are we? You're facing south on Satilla Drive. And so when you were standing behind the oak tree, was it about here? Yes. And you said this is fair and accurate at the time, meaning back in spring of 2020. Right. Are the Porta potty's gone now. But it was there back then. Yeah. Come here for a moment. 
Mr. Albenzi, I'm going to pass you over to the defense. They may have some questions for you. Thank you very much. Mr. Wood. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Good morning, sir. Good morning. <clears throat> Mr. Albenzi, we've met before. Yes. We met about a month and a half ago, two months ago now. I suppose, yeah. Out near your house? Yes. Okay. We talked about the testimony you're giving here today. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you don't want to be here. Rather be elsewhere, yes. Almost anywhere else, probably. This has been very difficult for you, correct? Yeah. Um, it's caused you personally some problems. Um, as a, res as a result of your role in calling 911? Yes, it is. You've had some concerns at work? Yes. You've had um, concerns about your neighborhood, Satilla Shores? Yes. And even personal attacks on you, phone calls, things like that? Recently, yes. Recently. Even though all you did was call 911? Uh, not 911, but... Uh, yeah. The, the, the non-emergency number? Right. Okay. Um, and that's that's put you in a difficult spot in general. Yeah, I mean, it's put me in a spot. I wouldn't say it's really difficult, but it is something I'm not used to. Okay. Um, well, let, let's talk about your <clears throat> your call to Glen County Police Department for a second and orient the jury a little bit. When you were in your yard cutting uh, the wood, you'd already uh, gotten most of the tree done. You were you were continuing to split logs from a fallen tree in your yard. Right. right. You're out in your front yard, and you're you can see down from your house down towards Larry English's house. Right. Now, you had talked to Larry English before, right? Yes. You said six to twelve times somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah. You share mailboxes with him. Well, it's I don't mean the same mailbox. Same area, it? yeah. So there's a group of mailboxes at the end of the road, right here, behind the stop sign. Right. Okay. Four or five mailboxes. And and multiple neighbors have to go to that spot to get their mail every day. Yes. You have to walk down Jones to the corner of Jones and Satilla to get your mail. Yes. And of course, Mr. English has a mailbox there as well. I don't think he has a mailbox yet. I'm oh, okay. He didn't have one yet, but that's where you would see him and talk to him occasionally. Yes. Okay. And on those occasions when you would see him, y'all would discuss how's the construction coming, how's things going, right? Right. You knew he had a heart problem. Yeah. So you knew his health was impaired. Yeah. You knew he was building the house as kind of a second home for him. Yes. You knew he lived some distance away. Right. And you knew he stored valuables on the property. I suppose. You knew he had a boat on the property. Right. You knew he had um, a camper on the property. Yeah. You knew he stayed in the camper when he would come to work on the house. Right. And the garage where he kept the boat, he had a regular car garage, but he also had an RV garage, the bigger garage. Right. To fit his boat or an RV or whatever he wanted to put in it. Yes. Okay. He had talked to you about this intruder on his, in his house, right? Yes. And he even went so far as to show you the video of a black male behind his house on his dock. Right. And you understood that on the dock was a boat on a hoist. I, I don't know if the, I'm, I'm not, I can't tell you what was on the, no, I, I was, I don't know the arrangement of his dock, no. Okay, so you weren't aware there was a boat back there? Right, I, I couldn't tell you if the boat was on the dock or in the garage or where at the time. Did you know if Mr. English had multiple boats? Yeah, I think he had two or three boats. Okay, that he stored on the property? 
from time to time. Even though it was open and unsecured, this this house, it was still his property as you understood it. Right. He wasn't inviting people to come onto the property when he's not there, right? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. This mail he showed you in the video, did Mr. English tell you he was authorized to be on the dock? No. Okay. As far as you understood, he was not authorized to be on the dock. That's right. And you understood that even though the house had no doors on it, it was still Mr. English's property, right? Yes. And he could decide who's allowed to come and not come on the property. Yes. You were aware that, uh, and you even tell the Glen County Police, this guy, meaning the man you're seeing on the property on February 23rd, has been to the house multiple times. And that's what it said on the call, but it, it might have been the heat of the moment. And you know, it's, I can't say who it was, that guy, or just somebody that looks like it's what I probably meant to say. Okay, so you didn't know who that male was standing in the yard when you saw look down Jones no but to you he looked like the guy you had seen in the video right and you knew that this guy who you saw in the video had actually been to the house not just that one time but a bunch of times right again you didn't know if it was the same guy but it was enough to pique your interest to walk down Jones yes sir okay in fact you tell the uh, Glen County non-emergency number He's been caught on the camera a bunch before at night. That's what you said in the call we just heard. That's what I said, yeah. Okay. It's kind of an ongoing thing out here. It had been. From that guy, or at least I, the guy I can't, I can't say it was that guy, just somebody that fit that description. Okay. So you felt like this guy had been there before, you saw a video of it, and he's here again. Or at least this, it, you suspected he's here again. I suppose. Okay. And that's what you told the police? Yeah. Okay. You also told the police that the guy's building a house, the guy being Larry English, and right. he's got heart issues. Right. Again, information you got from Mr. English. Right. Okay. And you knew of Mr. English's frustration at this guy, or the guy you saw in the video, not being caught. I don't really know but we'd call it frustration. I can't speak to the man's state of mind. No. Did he ever explain to you how frustrated he was? I don't recall. Okay. I mean, nobody's happy when somebody snoops around in their stuff, so. Right, but, I mean, but he no, was he, not happy this man was on his dock. I suppose not. Express that to you? I don't recall. You say to the to the Glen County police operator, um, we've had some break-ins out here, right? Right. One of the first things you said, this is Matt Albenzi, we've had some break-ins out here. Right. Okay. Now, what you're talking about is what Ms. Donikoski asked you. You were aware from the Facebook page that there was crime, property crime in the neighborhood. Yes. And people were posting about it on the Facebook page and uh, next door page, if, if you're aware of that. Right. Okay. Do you subscribe to both? Uh, I think I logged into that, but I can't get back into it. It's just kind of wonky. I just, no. Okay. But, but people had shared their own personal experience with property crimes in Satilla Shores. Right. And it seemed to be an ongoing problem in 2019, now 2020. It was, yeah. Around the same time that this man that you saw uh, on the video was coming into Larry English's house. Right. And in fact, um, you were, not only were you aware of it, but, but many people in the neighborhood were aware of this intruder in Larry Objection. English's house. Same objection, Mr. Ridge, to me. What other people are aware of would be speculation of this person's, on um, Mr. Albenz's part. Sustained. Did you ever tell the GBI when you were interviewed that everyone in the neighborhood okay. is aware of it? Not a prior consistent statement or prior inconsistent statement. And once again, him saying it to someone else does not get it out of speculation on his part. The question is simply whether he. He was told the GBI. When whether he was told the GBI that. Okay, that's okay. Go ahead. Do you remember being interviewed by the GBI? I do. 
Do you remember telling the GBI that you're aware of the guy back at the house and everyone in the neighborhood was aware of it? Uh, I can't say everybody, but it was, you know, people that were posting things, you know, people, neighbors talk to neighbors, so I suppose most neighbors were aware that there were break-ins occurring. And not just break-ins, but break-ins at Larry English's house. I don't know what, who knew about that, but... You may not know who in particular were aware of it, but you told the GBI that everyone in the neighborhood was aware of, and I understand that's a figure of speech. Right. But you told the GBI that. Okay. Yeah. Correct? Uh, yep. Okay. You were also aware that not only was uh, this black male on the dock and at Larry English's house on multiple occasions, but that things were missing from Mr. English's house. Right. In fact, you were aware that electronics were stolen and a cooler was stolen. Objection to what Larry English told him. I know the form of the question is you're aware of this, but the only way Mr. Albenzi would be aware of this is if it was hearsay coming from Mr. English. And I believe Mr. Rubin previously objected to my asking this witness what Mr. Larry English told him. So anything he's aware of from Mr. English would come from Mr. English would be hearsay. And I'm not asking, uh, I'm not offering it for the truth of the matter, whether the items were actually stolen, but to go to this witness's knowledge and to explain why he did what he did on February 23rd. I understand it's not being admitted for the, the truth of the statement itself, just to explain the witness. Uh, go ahead. Okay. So, Mr. Albenzi, um, you had knowledge, you were aware that items were stolen from Mr. English's house. Yes. And items were, were in his boat stored at the house. Right. And those items were electronics, right? Yep. And a Yeti cooler. Yep. And so you were aware of, um, well, let me back up. To your knowledge, those items had never been recovered. I do not know. Okay. Were you present at Mr. English's house on February 11th, 2020, when police arrived at the house? I think I walked down, saw all the, the blue lights, you know, they flash all over the place. So I went down there to see what was going on. And this is at night? Right. It's dark out? Yeah, yeah. Same, um, it was dark from the video you saw, I'm sorry, I'm going back to the previous video from Mr. English's house, it was dark that time too. Uh, I can't remember if there was lighting. I don't know if there was a lamp back there, What I, I, don't, I don't recall. But it was at night? It was at night. Okay, so now February 11th, 2020, you see blue lights in front of Mr. English's house at 220 Satilla Drive, correct? Right. You were curious. I was. You knew about Mr. English's previous problems. Yeah. With theft at his house, right? So you went down to see what was going on. Right. Did you see Travis McMichael down there? I can't remember if he was there or not. I, yeah, I think he was there. Okay. Did Couple. you see Greg McMichael there? I don't remember. Okay. But you do remember Travis? Pretty sure. Do you remember talking to any officers there? I think that's... I do remember talking to one officer. After you went down there on the 11th, um, did you have any more conversations with Larry English about his house? I don't recall. Okay. Did you ever talk to Subi Lawrence about the thefts in the neighborhood? Possibly. You're friends with Miss Lawrence, or at least neighborhood Neighbor, acquaintances? Yeah, neighborly friends. Diego Perez? Yeah. Um, Ronnie Olson? Yeah. And Ronnie lives at the corner. Right, that's was, Ronnie's garbage cans there. Right, so the property, the oak tree where you stood behind to make your call, this is right in Ronnie Olson's front yard. That's right. And if Mr. English is 220 Satilla Drive, Ronnie Olson is 219 Satilla, across from Mr. Mr. English. Yes, yes, he is. Okay. <laughs> Did 
you ever talk to Brooke Perez? Occasionally. About theft in the neighborhood? I don't know what all we talked about. Okay. <clears throat> the man you saw in the videos that Larry English showed you and the man you saw on February 23rd, 2020, you had not seen either of those men before in the neighborhood? No. Okay. You never saw either man, if they're different, to your knowledge, jogging in the no. neighborhood. Now, how long you've, you've lived there? 32 years? Yeah. Okay. Not aware of that man or a man fitting that description jogging in the neighborhood? No. Okay. The man that you saw when you first saw him on February 23rd was not jogging. No. In fact, he was just standing in the yard. That's right. Did you see him look around? I, it seemed like he was just looking around. Okay. Um, wasn't bent over, out of breath? No. Wasn't tying his shoes, lacing them up? Not that I recall, no. Okay. You didn't know if that man was armed or not? No. Okay. Before you went down to make your phone call at the corner of Satilla and Jones, <clears throat> you grabbed two things. Yep. Cell phone. Yep. And your nine millimeter. That's right. You put the nine millimeter in your pocket. I did. That's for your protection. Yep. <clears throat> because you just didn't know what was going on there. Nope. Okay. You called 911. I mean, I'm sorry, you called the non emergency number. And as you're calling, you're looking at the house. Correct. And you see a person in the house. I saw the person, then I called. Okay. Saw a person through the window of the house. Right. window, I'm trying not to get in anybody's way, the front, do the front of the house is, is over here, here's the garages, right? Right. The window's over here. Right. You saw the man that you suspected as, as being an intruder walking through the house through those windows. Right. At some point, you stepped out from behind the oak tree, right. and that man came out and then took off. Yeah. You suspected he saw you, and that's why he took off. I don't know. I know you don't know, but you suspected it. I, I don't know why he took off running. I don't know if he saw me or not. Well, you told Diego Perez you suspected he saw you. Okay, then. Right? Yeah. Okay. And you told the GBI that you suspected he saw you. At least it was possible in your mind, and you felt some guilt over that. I did because you felt like you put into motion these events that turned tragic. I thought maybe if he has, hadn't seen me, he wouldn't have run away. I don't know. Right. And that, of course, it still weighs heavy on your heart. Yes. Okay. After <clears throat> you, you were, while you were making your call, and you watched him run off into the neighborhood, Right. You continued to walk down Satilla, past Mr. Wade's house, who's right there, right. to at least in front of Diego Perez's house. Right? right. So that's two houses down from Larry English's house. Right. And that's where you made your motion. Right. Right. At that point, you're only two houses from the McMichael's house, correct? Two or three, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Prior to Ahmad Arbery, the man we now know to be Ahmad Arbery, running out of the house, did you ever see him through the window duck down? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. You don't recall? I don't recall. Okay. Mm. 
Excuse me one minute, Ms. Chavez. Anything from the other defendants? Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Albenzi. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jessica Burton. I am co-counsel for Roddy Bryan. Uh, first, I understand you might know my co-counsel, Kevin Goff. Uh, I helped my brother clean some trees up at his yard after one of the hurricanes several years ago. Okay, so then you have not spoken with Mr. Goff then about your testimony today? No. Okay. Um, did you speak with Roddy Bryan on February 23rd, 2020 prior to the incident? No. Okay. And at that point you hadn't spoken with him for several, several years at that point, is that correct? I suppose yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, and on February 23rd, 2020, prior to the incident, um, you also did not see him, no. correct? Okay. That's all I have for you. Thank you. Any redirect from the state? Yes, Judge. So when we're talking about what you're aware of with regard to Larry English, um, you were aware that he suspected his contractors of stealing the items off the boat. I wouldn't say he suspected them, but maybe that was a possibility. And how did you learn about that possibility? I mean, he, we spoke about it. And you were aware that he had no idea if the items were stolen off the boat while the boat was at that construction site or somewhere else? I have no idea. Okay. And you don't know what's in the mind of the other neighbors within the Satilla Shores neighborhood, do you? No. You have no idea who knows what about Larry English's property, do you? No. And the video he showed you was the one on the dock, and he, I think you said between October and November? Yeah. Okay. I think defense counsel asked you if you were friends with Subi Lawrence. Right. Okay. Um, but I think it was unclear. Did you talk to Subi Lawrence at all about Larry English's house? I don't recall. I don't, we don't speak very often. Okay. And Diego Perez, you're, you know him. Right. Did you talk with him about Larry English's house? I may have, but I, don't, I couldn't tell you what the conversation was or when it was or what it was about. But, I mean, we talk about these things. You know, it's a, neighbors share concerns about what's going on. Okay. But you don't have any specific recollections of these things? No. Okay. And what, Ronnie Olson is one of your good friends, right? He's, he's a buddy, yeah. Okay. And at one point in time, um, did you and Mr. Olson believe that the crime that was happening at Satilla Shores was due to a homeless guy under a bridge? I don't know. I heard people talk about homeless people under the bridge. I never saw them. Don't know. Okay. But this was something else that the people in the neighborhood were talking about, right? Right. Okay. And that homeless guy under the bridge, he was a suspect in the 2019 entering autos, right? I don't know. Well, did you suspect him? No. I mean, I, I don't even know if there was a homeless guy under the bridge, so no. So this is all just rumor and innuendo going around? I suppose. Yeah. Now, you just testified. You don't know if Mr. Arbery saw you or not from inside the house where you're standing under the tree, right? No, I don't. Okay. And you told Diego Perez that you didn't know whether he saw you or not. Is that what you told Diego Perez? I don't remember what I told Diego. Hi. And the direction Mr. Arbery ran 
when he left the house. He went towards the McMichael house, right? Yes. Okay. If he'd gone the other way, where would he have gone? Out towards Highway 17. Out towards Highway 17. Right. Out of Satilla Shores. Right. I'll pass the witness if there's any recross. Any recross. Hello. Just a quick question. Objection. It's two separate defendants. Pardon me? Right, there were no questions and not yet. Okay, I'll let Mr. Rubin do it. Okay. I'm just you get Frank's face <laughs> I'm confused, but I guess it doesn't matter. Well, it does. What, what we had was a cross by Mr. Rubin, uh, no cross, and then We'll, we'll discuss it at a break and just make sure everybody's on the same page with how we're operating. Go ahead. Mr. Albenzi, the direction you saw uh, the man we now know as Ahmad Arbery run was to your left, right? Yes. Away from the entrance to Satilla Shores Highway 17. Yes. You're on the phone calling the police to come to the neighborhood and check this out. The police would be coming from the direction of Highway 17. Yes. Coming into the neighborhood. Right. right. Going down the street, again, in the direction that Mr. Arbery ran. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Brown. No, you are. Uh, thank you, sir. You may step down. Are we, I know with the police witnesses, they were subject to recall. Is he subject to recall? Yes, he is subject to recall. You are released for the day. You are subject to recall. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Trying to work through timing. Yes, Judge. Um, I believe our next witness will be um, Stephen Lowry, um, and I think he's going to take a while. I would say so. <coughs> Maybe this would be a good time to put another matter on the record. We could get into him for an hour and then break for lunch, whichever the court pleases. Well, I was planning to break. I was thinking around noon. Um, I think that works from a timing standpoint. I don't plan to get into a full hour. Um, so that being the case, I plan to break the witness in about 30 minutes or so. That's fine. All right. State's next witness. The state called Stephen Lowry. Tell the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Go ahead and see. Thank you, sir. Take a mask off. Good morning. Good morning. Please go ahead and introduce yourself to the jury. Um, tell them your name and spell it for the court reporter. Okay. Good morning. My name is Stephen Lowry. It's S T E P H A N L O W. R E Y. And um, Mr. Lowry, how are you currently employed? I do contract work at a local business for computer repairs. Okay. Part time. Part time. Um, are you also in school at the moment? Yes, ma'am. I'm a full time student. Okay. And what are you studying? Uh, network operations and security. It's uh, more computer stuff. Computer stuff. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, how long have you held your current job? Uh, I started there in May. In May of this year, 2021. Yes, ma'am. Okay. What were you doing before that? Um, I worked at FedEx for a short while as a courier, and prior to that, I was in law enforcement. Okay. Where were you employed when you were in law enforcement? Uh, originally with BPD, the Brunswick Police Department, and then Glen County PD. How long were you with Brunswick PD? 
I, I think roughly like four and a half or five years. Okay. Do you recall when you started with them? Uh, late 2012. 2012. Okay. So four, about four to five years, you said? Somewhere in there, yes, ma'am. Okay. And what did you do when you were with um, Brunswick PD? Uh, mostly patrol. I was assigned to narcotics for a while and a aggressive patrol division. Okay, so mostly dealing with like drug cases, narcotics. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, after you left Brunswick PD, where did you go? Uh, I went to Glenn County. I was already working out of that building because we shared an office. It was a, a joint drug unit. Okay. And I remained working as a drug investigator for the county for another, I think, eight or nine months before I went back to patrol. Okay, do you remember when you started in terms of the year with Glenn County PD? Um. I don't for sure. Okay. Um, all right. So when you started with Glen County PD, what was your position there? Uh, a narcotics investigator. Okay. I want to turn your attention to February 23rd, 2020. Okay. Okay. Were you with Glen County PD at that time? I was. Okay. What was your position at that time? A uh, criminal investigator. Okay. And were you with a specific department? Yes, ma'am. The Glen County PD. Okay. Um, department within that uh, agency? Division. Um, the Criminal Investigation Division. Okay. All right. And can you just please tell the jurors, what were your primary duties? Um, investigating crimes that surpassed, I guess, what patrol officers could handle with their equipment and their training. Okay. And um, were you post-certified at that time? Yes. Does that essentially mean that you had arrest powers under Georgia law? Yes. Okay. Now, um, before February 23rd of 2020, had you worked homicide cases? Uh, I, I'd assisted with some, but never any of my own. Never, never any of your own? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, do you remember how many you had assisted with? Not like many. Like a ballpark number? M maybe between one and five. I, I don't think we had many. Okay, so between one and five homicide cases. Yes, maybe. That's very, very rough. Okay. And homicide meaning someone's dead? Um, well, I can think of one that I did work on just in the sense of someone being dead, but it was a, a drug sale kind of thing. Okay. All right. And um, were you the lead on any of these homicide cases? The, the drug overdose case, I was, but that wasn't kind of what I was thinking of with homicide. Okay. I've never had a homicide involving like a prior to this, any sort of, I guess, violent act, touching, okay. shooting, or anything like that. Okay, so no shooting homicide, is that correct? Yes. And no, like, stabbing homicide? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so did you become, actually, strike that, uh, how many citizens' arrest cases had you worked prior to February 23rd, 2020? None. None, okay. Did you become involved in the investigation into the death of Ahmad Arbery? I did. Can you tell us how you became involved in that? Uh, yes, I was the on-call investigator that day. I was called out to the scene. And which day are we talking about? February 23rd of 2020. Okay. So do you remember what time you were called out? I, I don't. I think it was somewhat early afternoon. Okay, so early afternoon. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And do you remember who called you out? I uh, believe it was Sergeant Oliver. Sergeant Oliver. Okay, so when you're called out, what do you do? Um, I got dressed in my uniform, got into my car, and responded to the scene. Okay, when you say uniform, describe that for us. Um, at the time, it was, for us in CID, it was khaki BDU pants and a green polo. Okay. With a and county badge and, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I spoke over you. Go ahead. Uh, just a green polo with a county badge. Okay, um, were you wearing any kind of body cam? No. Okay, uh, explain why not. Uh, the body cams we were using a fix with magnets. Mm -hmm. I wasn't wearing a, a plate carrier that had my magnet inside of it, so I, I wasn't recording. Okay, and what car were you driving? Did you drive to the scene? Uh, it would have been an unmarked county car. I don't remember the make and model, but it was probably a Ford Fusion. Okay, and when you say unmarked, what does that mean? Uh, it's equipped with police equipment like lights, sirens, all that, but it's unmarked. It doesn't have Glen County PD markings or any, any police markings. Okay. And was that car equipped with dash cam? No. Okay. So no dash cam on that day? Correct. Okay. So um, where was this scene located that you were called out to? In Satilla Shores here in Glen County. Okay. And um, when you arrived on scene, tell the jury what it looked like. What did you see? Um... I arrived on scene, I saw the decedent laying in the roadway with a 
caution tape or police police crime scene tape surrounding him. I I spoke to Officer Roberts, who kind of briefed me on the information that she had gathered at that point. Okay. So you spoke to Officer Roberts. Did um, Officer Roberts hand anything over to you? She did. What did uh, she hand over to you? It was a thumb drive that was containing video footage from a, I think, Diego Perez. Okay. And did you come to find out that there was a certain cell phone that was um, in another officer's car? I did. Okay. Whose cell phone was that? Uh, that was Mr. William Bryan's cell phone. Okay. And it was in Sergeant Leska's car. Okay. And what did you do after that? Um, I spoke briefly with Mr. Bryan, who was on scene. Okay. I was told by another officer that he had already given consent for us to view a video that he had taken on his phone. Um, I spoke to him and just reconfirmed that verbal consent, and I viewed it on scene. Okay. And then I spoke with him a little longer. I got him to agree to come back to Glenn County headquarters for an interview okay. so that we could speak to him a little bit more in depth and do a download of the phone. He agreed. Where was Mr. Bryan on scene when you spoke with him? Um, he was standing on the corner of, I believe it was Holmes and Burford next to a bicycle in a tree. Okay. All right. And um, just going back for a moment. Did you recognize any, uh, other than the law enforcement officers, who you obviously knew because you worked with them, did you recognize anyone else on scene that day? Yes, I, I recognized Greg McMichael. Okay, and do you see him in court today? And if you need to stand up, you can do that. <coughs> no. This is that him there? Where Just, are you pointing to? Uh, to the to my right of the woman in the yellow shirt. I, I haven't seen him in a while. He looks a little different. He looks a little different. Okay. I apologize. Okay. And what, what color is he wearing for the record? A uh, blue jacket and I think a blue tie. Okay. Your Honor, let the record reflect that he has just identified Greg McMichael. So how did you uh, recognize Greg McMichael? Um, I had seen him before coming to the police department to, I, I always assumed he was delivering subpoenas, but I'd seen him coming in the back door carrying papers sometimes, and I, I knew that he was an investigator for the Glenn DA's office, so. Okay, and um, what was your relationship with him, if any? Uh, there wasn't one, I mean, maybe, hey man, as I, as I pass him, if I happen to be coming in as he's going out or something. Okay, all right. Did you all ever kind of go over to each other's houses or anything like that? No. Okay. Um, do you recognize uh, William Bryan, who you yes. spoke upon scene? Okay. Can you just point him out, describe what he's wearing? It's going to be Mr. Bryan there. He's got on a blue jacket and a gray shirt. I can't make out the tie color. Okay. Let the record reflect that he has just identified yes. William Bryan. So, um, Mr. Lowry, so you said you got the phone and you said you viewed the video. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. And then you spoke with Mr. Bryan to ask him if he would come to headquarters for an interview. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, when you spoke with him, did you pressure him in any way to talk to you? No. Okay. Did you? I will object. We can put that in context. When and where is this taking place? I can ask specifically. Sure. Excuse me. So the questions I'm asking you now: Are you still located on the scene? Yes. Okay, there at the intersection of Holmes and Satilla. Yes. And Satilla Shores, right? Okay. So at the point where you're talking to Mr. Bryan, you testified that he was near a bicycle. Yes. There. Okay. So at that point, did you pressure him in any way to come talk to you at headquarters? Uh, no pressure. I, I just asked if he would mind. If he would mind coming to talk to you. Something to that effect. Yeah. And what did he say? Uh, it wasn't a problem or okay. He, okay. he seemed willing to go. Okay. Um, did you promise him anything of benefit, anything like that? No. At that point, was he under arrest? No. Was he detained? No. Was he in any kind of custody? No. Okay. So, um, what happened next? Um, I went back to headquarters and I conducted an interview with Mr. Bryan. Okay, and how did Mr. Bryan get back to headquarters? Uh, he drove, he drove his own vehicle. He drove his own vehicle. By chance, do you recall what vehicle he was driving? Uh, it was a Chevy Silverado. I think it was like dark gray. You said what now? Chevy Silverado, I, I think it was dark gray. Okay, 
And um, when he got back to headquarters, where did he go for that interview? Uh, one of our interview rooms. Okay. And are those rooms equipped with uh, video? Yes. To record and audio as well? Yes. Okay. Now, in the beginning of your uh, video interview, did you go over any kind of forms with Mr. Bryant? Uh, yes, I, I think I went, I, I went over a uh, consent to search form. Even though he had already given verbal consent, I think I just filled out a, a written form. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes. Thank you. Now, Mr. Lowry, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit 298. Take a look at it and tell me if you recognize it. Yes, this is, a, this is the form that I filled out. Okay, and uh, is it a, a true and accurate copy of that form? Yes. Appear to be altered in any way? No. Your Honor, at this time we would tender State's 298. No objection. No objection. <coughs> it's admitted. Permission to publish, Judge? Go ahead. Okay. So, let's see if I can get this to work for me here. So, Mr. Lowry, I'm going to ask you, can you see this on your form? Yes, ma'am. On your uh, monitor? Yes, okay. ma'am. So, if you can just make sure you're projecting your voice and speaking into the microphone, can you just go ahead and read this? Um, what does it say here at the top? It's the Glen County Police Department General Investigations Unit. Okay. And I won't ask you to read all this fine print. That's the address and all that, right? Yes. Okay. So start from here and just read that for us. Consent to search form, cellular phone. I, I just got a blank where I search of my cellular telephone under my control or custody. I hereby permit Investigator S. Lowry and any other officers designated by him or her to assist in the search of my phone. The location of the phone is listed as 157 Public Safety Boulevard. Uh, make is an iPhone, it's a Model 8. And I didn't list the serial IMEI service and there was no PIN. Okay. Underneath that it says, I understand the purpose of this consent to search is for the express purpose of searching said cellular telephone for evidence relating to the crime of aggravated assault or homicide. I have not been promised a reward of any type. I have not been threatened in any manner. I freely and voluntarily give my consent to conduct said search of the above described telephone to the above officer with full understanding of my rights and actions. I understand that this consent is voluntary on my part and may be revoked at any time. Signed this 23rd day of February 2020, signed by Mr. Prine. Okay, and um, did you pressure him or force him in any way to sign that? No, ma'am. Okay, you didn't promise him anything? No. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, get too close to you, may give you some feedback. Um, so, uh, Mr. Lowry, you talked about the interview being audio and video recorded, right? Yes. Okay. Now, before coming to court today to testify, were you able to review that recording of Mr. Bryan's interview in its entirety? Yes. Does it appear to be accurate? Yes. Okay. At this time, um, we would tender states 195. No objection. No objection. No objection. It's admitted. Thank you. Now, in conjunction with that audio recording and video recorded interview, did you also look at the transcript prepared of that interview? I did. Okay. And did you look at it in its entirety? I did. Did it seem to match up the interview itself? It did. Was the wording identical? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and may I approach Judge? Yes. All right. So I'm showing you what's been marked. For the purposes of identification as States Exhibit 195A, is that the same transcript that you reviewed that we just talked about? Uh, yes, it looks like it is. Okay. At this time, Judge, we would tender 195A. No objection. No objection. Mm -hmm. Just for the record, Your Honor. It's admitted for the record.
Mr. Lowry, so let's go ahead and, and go through some of these statements that Mr. Bryan made to you, okay? okay. So you have the transcript there, and I'm also going to put ep excerpts up on this screen right here. So you can follow in the transcript or you can follow up on the screen, okay? okay? All right, so um, just starting with the basics, did Mr. Bryan tell you what he was doing on the day in question on the 23rd of February 2020 around 1 p.m. or so? Um, I, I can't read what's on the screen. There's nothing on there right now. But you, okay, you not able I, was, to... I was looking for the page and line references. Okay, not for this, but oh. when I start putting it up, it should be up there, okay? okay? So did he tell you um, what he was doing around 1 p.m. on February 23rd, 2020? Yes, I believe he was working on his porch or his garage or something like that. Okay. And um, would, do you remember specifically what he said he was doing? Uh, I can find it. Okay, if looking at the transcript will help you, go ahead and look at that. Yes, he did say on the front porch. Okay, so he's working on his front porch, and did he say that something happened to um, kind of catch his attention? Yes. As he's working on his front porch? Yes. What did he say happened? Um, I looked up. Uh, can I quote it? Okay. Let's do this. Let me direct you to the line. Okay, so go to page four. Yes, ma'am. Lines 11 through 12, and stop at that period there after road. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bryan says, front porch of the house, I looked up, see a black guy running down the road. Okay, and did he also say something about a truck nearby? Yes. Okay, and you, you don't have to quote, you can just uh, speak from your memory of the transcript at this point. Uh, yes, he, he saw a truck paralleling or following okay. the, uh, the other person he identified. As the black guy running? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. And after this, what did he do? Um, he said, y'all got him, like a question. Okay. And did he say that to the black guy or to the truck? Uh, to the truck. Did he ever ask the black guy if he was okay? Not that he told me. Did he ever ask the black guy if he needed help? No, ma'am. Okay. So after he hollered, y'all uh, <coughs> y'all got him, what did he do? Um, he went to go to his truck to assist and realized he didn't have his keys. So he went back into his house, retrieved the keys, and got in his truck and kind of joined in. Okay. And 307 Burford, Mr. Bryan's address, what neighborhood is that located in? Sensitilla Shores. Okay. So I'm going to put up here on the screen... Right here. So at the point where Mr. Bryan gets in his truck, did he go out onto the road? Um, no. He, should I read again or just my own words? Um, your own words is fine. Uh, no, he, he sat there for a second and kind of assessed. Okay. Waited, waited on Mr. Aubrey to come back towards him. Okay. Um, and what road is directly in front of Mr. Bryan's house? Uh, Burford. Okay. So if you can just read here, page 5, lines 18 through 25. Okay. Uh, so I just kind of sat there for a minute and didn't really... I'm going to object. I think we've got a matter we need to take up outside the jury. Okay. Okay. Well, um, let's do this then. Ladies and gentlemen, probably a good break at point then for lunch. Uh, we're going to break until, uh, since we're going to be addressing some matters before the court, probably 1 o'clock. Let's plan on 1 o'clock for the continuation of the evidence. Uh, again, hold on a sec. During the break, do not discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anybody else. Don't go looking for any information about the case. And again, if somebody's talking about it in your presence of hearing, please let the court know, and we'll see if we need to address that. Thank you. All right, sir, jury.
seated. All right, sir, I'm going to ask that you go ahead and step down. Yes, sir. Uh, if I could have you back here just before 1 o'clock for a continuation of evidence in the case, I remind you that you are under oath, so do not discuss your testimony with anyone during the break. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Goff. Right. It seems like it's getting increasingly more difficult for Mr. Bryan to receive a fair trial. And I feel, I'm not saying that the state is trying to make it difficult, but as a practical matter, the state is cutting these statements, and I understand the desire to, to satisfy the McMichael defendants and their root concerns, but the state is cutting up these statements so they are fundamentally being changed. And then when I cross -examine, try and cross-examine, the answer is going to be, oh, well, we didn't have any choice. And I, I'm, I'm not saying that there isn't some truth to that. But we're cutting up these statements to the point where uh, what's being presented is consciously or unconsciously misleading. We're also, instead of asking, as I thought we did the other day, uh, with the, the Mr. Uh, Minshew, uh, we're not asking, uh, directing your attention to page so-and-so, line so-and-so, uh, do you recall what happened next? We're editorializing and we're changing the meaning of what's being said. For example, Roddy Bryan never said in the transcript that he hollered at anyone. More to the point, it's clear from the transcript itself that it was evident to Mr. Bryan that nobody could hear him. The, the, the characterization of what he's doing as hollering is unsupported by the record. It's unsupported by the transcript. And then I have to try and get into that. We're talking about seeing the black guy going by. It's not clear that he's being followed by the truck. Now, that I understand the state wants to present that through other evidence. We've got the night owl video and so forth. But this is for Mr. Bryan, this is a critical witness in the case. And this material is being cut up and presented in a way that's troubling. For example, Ms. Oliveira, and I'm not saying it's done intentionally. I understand the difficulty here. But for example, we've heard the words chase used. The police report used the words follow. Now all of a sudden, Mr. Bryan is saying that he joined in. Mr. Bryan never used those words. And I would point out, Your Honor, that the way all this is happening is that the state is leading former Detective Lowry through the statement. Now, if he's leading him to pages and lines and he's simply directed to that point to present evidence to the court, that's one thing. But to be leading the witness into statements like hollered and joined in, that is not simply allowing the state to get the evidence in front of the jury. It is leading to twist the narrative in ways that I would respectfully submit whether the state pondered it or not are simply unfair and violative of my client's rights. And I'm, it's not that we're not trying to work through it. And maybe over lunch, some of these issues will go away. And I'm not asking the court at this point to bring the jury back in and give a curative instruction. I'm not asking for any admonishments. But I would just urge the state, and maybe the court could provide some guidance, that if we're going to go beyond asking page and line references and what was actually said, then we're not going to be able to lead them there. I can lead all day long. I can do that, but they can't. Let me join in this because the statements that are being made, did he indicate that he joined in? Yes, he did. What did he say? I got in my car and pulled him to the road. That's a problem. He's not saying he joined in. He just says, I got in my car, but because of the question. So we join in that motion. It is unfair characterization. I think the court should say, from this point forward, you just need to say, read line one or two through line four or five and leave it at that without characterizing it beyond what's actually said. Greg McMichael joins this motion as well. So take it on the defense aren't going to be editorializing either. And they're just pointing to one page. What did he say is the question. Not okay. did he say I, Maybe I should know. Okay. Just like, let me just, uh, let me hear from the state. I, 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 I do want to address, we're doing it a little differently with this witness. And, and I think that may be where most of this objection seems to be coming from, but from the state. Your Honor, on page four of the transcript, 
in terms of um, Mr. Goff's complaint that I uh, used the word hollered, his client actually used the word hollered. His client said, so I started running towards my truck and I hollered at that point. I said, y'all got him? So that was a word from Mr. Bryan himself. And I understand that I didn't have excerpts for Officer Minch's testimony, but it's essentially the transcript that the witness is reading from. It just helps as a visual aid for the jurors as well. So I went ahead and got excerpts from the transcript, but nothing has changed in terms of me adding or deleting anything. Okay, here's what, okay, what I heard. The, as counsel is aware, you know, the struggle with doing the statements in this way is we're having witnesses testify to individual statements that aren't coming in because of these brutal issues and other discussions that the court was not privy to before we got into trial. So this is a different, it's not the normal way, it's not, and it's permissible to do it this way. It just creates a lot of issues like this. Um, what I think I heard and I agree with is what happened just a moment ago is the witness effectively summarized what he thought the statement was and then was asked again what the statement was and the statement got presented on the screen. That's how I heard it. Um, that, the objection to that um, it, is similar to objections I was getting about getting into the minds of the individual who's making the statement and from my perspective sort of mixing up true statements by individuals and what they're what other people thought they may be saying and that's been going round and round I think with a number of different uh, witnesses here uh, and I'm trying to figure out how to bring this together in a nice bow to be clear but where I'm going with it is if we've got a witness up on the stand and he's putting up the defendant's statement we need to ensure for the jury and for the clarity of the transcript what the defendant's statement is as opposed to somebody else's interpretation y'all can argue whatever you want about those statements at some point later in the trial and that's starting to be what's going on here you'll have that opportunity I'll give you that full opportunity at some point but that's not what we're doing here and so what I'd like to do is instead of getting somebody to interpret the statement, if it exists in the transcript, present the statement. And yes. if there is a rule uh, of completeness issue, let's go ahead and put the complete statement out there if you believe that there is more to the statement than has been presented. Yes, Your Honor. And if I may just add one thing, I know in the course of preparing for, for this trial and preparing for these statements to come in, we've spoken with the defense attorneys regarding, you know, some statements will be specific quotes, while others will be generally, what did he say or what did he do? And they seem to agree with that. Okay, am, well, am, I, am I not correct? Didn't we have that conversation? So, so. so here's, here's what I've discovered about all these agreements that were made before trial is the the moment the evidence started coming, all these agreements, everyone says, oh, Your Honor, we're not holding everybody to the agreements we had before trial. I will point out, none of these agreements were presented to the court in writing. There's nothing that I have to enforce them or not enforce them. I had encouraged counsel to go ahead and agree to whatever could be agreed to. Apparently, some of those agreements weren't as clear as counsel believed they were. There is very little the court can do about that. What I'm telling you, though, for clarity, Given this way that we're presenting the evidence, I think it's only fair that the jury understand what the statements of the defendants actually were, if they're coming in this way. Uh, if there's some clarity that needs through completeness, the court's gonna permit that, as I indicated in my previous rulings. But as far as editorializing on them, and that y'all are welcome to do that. You will have the facts and evidence, and again, in closing, if there are reasonable deductions that can be reached from that evidence, go ahead and argue them. We don't need to be arguing at all now. I, I, I don't contest the state's need at some point to get into context. That's going to be an issue. Uh, and it may be as, as the evidence develops, it becomes appropriate even during the examination of this witness. Part of the problem is I think there was an agreement by one or more of the McMichael defendants with respect to root issues in Mr. Bryant's statements. And, and I don't have a problem with 
root issues being addressed. But what, what's happening as you go through the red versus the blue versus the yellow is the McMichael defendants' agreements with respect to the Bruton issues that my client doesn't have standing for do impact the rule of completeness where we're parsing up the statements like, I killed him and leave out in self-defense. It, 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 that's, that's where we're coming from. Over the break, I'll certainly do what I can to try and minimize those issues going forward. But I, I do think that I understand where the state's coming from with, with agreements on Bruton with co-counsel. But they can't resolve those issues without creating rule of completeness problems for Mr. Bryan. And I shouldn't have to spend hours going back through line by line, word by word, by word doing that. But we'll see. Well, Judge, just you know, so the court's clear, in whenever Mr. Lowry gets back on the stand, if you I could have step about closer to a microphone, sorry. please. I have about 12 excerpts taken directly from the transcript that I intend to place right there. And they're right from the transcript, so it will be quotations. Again, the courts instruct the counsel how I'd like for this to proceed. Um, if we can do it that way, then it's pretty clear to the court how we can move along. If we start deviating, then we'll see the reasons for deviating and whether we'll allow that to come in. All right. Uh, it is just about one o'clock. Uh, sorry, twelve o'clock. We're going to go ahead and recess until one o'clock for lunch. Anything from the state before we recess? No, Your Honor. From Travis McMichael. No, Your Honor. From Greg McMichael. No, Your Honor. From Mr. Brown. No, Your Honor. All right. Uh, we will see you at one o'clock. Thank you. We're in recess. You need to account for this. Your Honor, I don't want to, I don't want to jury here. He's commenting on my client's right to remain silent. No, Your Honor, I am making the point that after hearing everything in the case, now he's tailoring his story to what has already been introduced. That the is problem the is, this is a grave constitutional violation for you to talk about the defendant's silence. And that is, and, and, the, and you're right, you're right on the, you're right on the borderline. And you may, you may be over, but uh, it better stop. Understood. This is, I can't think of the case, the initial case on it, but it's, uh, this is not permitted. All right, um, ask the jury to come in, please. Sustain the objection. You were armed with an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle that evening, correct? Yes. You had it loaded with 30 rounds of full metal jacket ammunition, correct? Yes. 
that weapon with 30 rounds is capable of killing at least 30 people, correct? Yes. You had arranged to have Dominic Black purchase that weapon for you in Ladysmith, Wisconsin in early May of 2020. Is that correct? Um, we were up north shooting and not shooting. We were up north going camping, and Dominic Black brought his rifle, and he was. We were talking. I was like, "Hey, what if we get a rifle for me? Um, you, I'll give you the money. You can purchase it. It's yours until I'm 18." So, I bought the rifle for Dominic, and I can use it. But once I'm 18, um, we can uh, do a private sale, and we can have it turned over to my name once I turned 18. Because you knew, as a 17-year-old. You could not have that gun, correct? I knew I could not buy that gun. You knew you could not possess that gun also, correct? No. You weren't aware that under Wisconsin law? I'm going to instruct the jury later about the law. So, and that he wouldn't, what he thinks on the subject is not dispositive anyway. So um, he, it was unlawful for him to purchase the gun. It wasn't just unlawful for you to purchase it. It was unlawful for you to bring it home, correct? In Illinois, I wasn't able to bring it home because I didn't have a FOID card, a firearm owner identification card you in knew Illinois. In, you knew in Illinois that you couldn't get that until you turned 18, correct? No, you can get a FOID card at 16 in Illinois. But you didn't have one? I did not. And even after this gun was purchased for you in May, you never got one after that either, did you? Actually, I applied for a FOID card in May of 2020, but due to the charges, and there was a backlog in Illinois because for the FOID card, but after you filed the charges against me, um, it was denied because of the charges here in this state. You found out about that after you were criminally charged in this case? I found out about this in November of 2020. A letter was sent to my old resident. So you knew that without that FOID card, the gun could not go back to your residence in Illinois, correct? Correct. And you agreed that the gun would be kept at Dominic Black's stepfather's house here in Kenosha, correct? Uh, because he had a safe, yes. And you agreed that you wouldn't have access to that gun, correct? Um, we agreed that the only time I would use the gun is when I would, when I was with him, and we would go to like the Bristol shooting range or up north to his land. But the only time prior to the night of August 25th, 2020, that you ever used that gun was up in Ladysmith, correct? Correct. So you didn't go to the Bristol shooting range ever. With I did. That gun. Not with that rifle, but I did. Pay attention to my question, please. You didn't ever go to the Bristol shooting range with that gun, correct? Correct. And you picked out that gun because Dominic had one, correct? I, yeah. You could have, if you wanted to, chosen from any number of guns that were for sale, fair enough? That were at that store, there weren't many, but yes. I'm sure the store in Ladysmith isn't the only store that sells guns, correct? Uh, you can ask questions. That was don't, a question. Don't, no, it was a statement. Isn't it correct, Mr. Rittenhouse, that there are other places to purchase guns besides that one store in Ladysmith, Wisconsin? Um, I believe so, but that's where we're at, so that's where we got the gun. And you, if you wanted to, could have given Dominic Black money to purchase a gun at other locations, fair? Didn't cross my mind, but now that you say it, yeah. Why did you pick or want Dominic Black to buy for you an AR-15 as opposed to a pistol or a shotgun or some other type of rifle? I cannot legally possess or carry a pistol because I'm not 18 in Wisconsin. I, I, I believe it's 18 in Wisconsin for a pistol. Um, but with the, lock, with the rifle, I knew, I knew I could possess that rifle. I knew I couldn't buy it, but I knew I could like take it to like the shooting range or possess it um, and with shotguns they didn't have any shotguns in stock that was my original plan to get a shotgun for trap shooting 
but there weren't any at that Lady Ladysmith store, and I didn't want to go to Walmart and buy one. So your understanding at that time was that Wisconsin law prohibited you as a 17-year-old from possessing a pistol, but you could have an AR-15? Yes. What was that understanding based on? Uh, the understanding was based on um, when we would go up north, uh, we were, it was me, Dominic, and my sister, and we were allowed to carry the rifles around, and the officers over there said it was fine. Um, I'm gonna move to strike as hearsay, what officers what would have told you. You asked the question of what the, what the source of his knowledge was. It, it's not admissible, and none of this is, frankly, and that's why I interrupted before. Um, what the what the defendant believes the law to be, what the district attorney believe, uh, believes the law to be, what uh, the defense believes the law to be, are irrelevant. I will tell you when I instruct you what the law of Wisconsin is pertaining to the possession of a firearm by a person under 18, uh, and that'll be the source of your knowledge. I'm allowing the testimony right now because it bears on uh, um, there's an old maxim under the law of ignorantia juris non excusat. Ignorance of the, of the law is not an excuse. Ignorance of the criminal law is not an excuse. If you commit a, wrong, a, a criminal act, whether you knew it was criminal or not, you're responsible for your conduct and, and because you're responsible to know the law. It's not relevant except in this case, there are specific issues about his awareness and knowledge about certain conduct that is relevant on some issues. So 